Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of Thinky Caps. And this week, Richard and I are really excited to bring in Peter McCormick. Peter McCormick was the co-founder of Exact Target. And if you don't know what that is, you probably haven't been around a long, giant messaging platform. And actually, Peter sold that to Salesforce, uh, which actually became the genesis of their Marketing Cloud Foundation. He's also the executive chairman here at Cheetah Digital. So we're extremely excited to have him on, his expertise, and we're gonna grill him on everything he needs to know. Thank you, Peter, firstly, for coming on. It's uh, great to have you on Thinking Caps. And I want to dig straight in. I know uh, we're, we're living through a tough period. We're, we're doing this from home. We're right in the middle of the COVID-19 health crisis. So uh, I want to maybe help take people's minds off stuff and, and take a, a little trip down memory uh, lane. So what did I wanted to kick it off and ask you, what, it, what was it about the experience of founding Exact Target um, pretty much 20 years ago now, is it? Yeah, it's crazy, it's crazy to even think about it. By the way, before, before we jump into it, I just have to note, this is my first time in a professional setting wearing a, a baseball hat, and it's very freeing. I mean, I shouldn't have to say that to either of the two of you, but I just feel great. Thanks for playing the part and uh, coming with the right wardrobe. And anytime, it. anytime. Well, um, yeah, we need... <laughs> We need your thinking cap on, so you, you've got it. So, yeah, so what, what is it about the experience of founding Exact Target 20 years ago that is relevant today? I think yeah. that, that's the topic. Yeah, it is crazy. It, it, it will be, uh, it'll be 20 years this fall uh, that we started Exact Target, and I started the business with two uh, really, really capable co-founders. In fact, in the spirit of I'd rather be lucky than good, uh, Scott Dorsey and Chris Baggett deserve a huge amount of the credit for driving the business forward. And I re re remain friends today. They're just incredible human beings and great business people. Um, and it's crazy to think that it was that it was 20 years ago. And when we started the business, uh, we, we, we really started the business uh, with, with two things that were, at the time, brand new. Uh, the first was email a as a marketing vehicle, right? People didn't really understand that email was going to be used as this one-to-one -one personal communication tool. Uh, and the other thing that was really brand new at the time is what's now called SaaS, software as a service. In fact, it was called ASP back then. So back in 2000 and late 2000, we had this email marketing application uh, delivered via a browser. Uh, and it was, and we originally worked with small and mid-sized businesses, a lot of mom and pop retailers. And really what we did is we helped those retailers build a list to, to learn more about their customers and then uh, leverage that information uh, in a permission manner to create and send messages. So as the business grew, uh, we maintained the small and mid-sized customers and we ended up adding enterprises, some of the biggest brands in the world. And we also ended up expanding the, the, the product offering to be more than email and at the time, social and mobile were big uh, communication channels, so we added those. Um, but it's funny, you asked the question, like what, what makes that experience relevant? And as, as I was thinking about that uh, prior to the podcast, I, I recognized that there were, uh, there were two books that heavily influenced uh, Exact Target, and I think heavily influenced the whole, all, everybody that was in the, the email digital marketing space. And I went back and I, and I looked at those two books, I reread them to a certain degree, and I was really, really surprised at how relevant both of those books were. They were both written in the 90s, but how relevant they are today. So tell us, tell us what were those books? And you know, if you could, give us a view of why things have gone you know, back to the future, as it were. Yeah, exactly. And I just, you know, of course, I've got my props here with me. Uh, the, the first book, and I, I, this is a bit of a book review uh, or a book club for digital marketing. The, the first book uh, is Strategic Database Marketing, and it's by Arthur Middleton Hughes. And this book, believe it or not, this book was written in 1994. So it was written- Wow, 1994. Actually, that was the yeah. year I was born. <laughs> you wish, buddy. <laughs> it's uh, the year before I got married, Richard. So. Frightening. But okay. still relevant so, today, but absolutely relevant today. It is absolutely relevant today. So the whole idea, so when, 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 when Hughes wrote this book, it was before the internet, and it was in an era uh, of, of, that, the, of variable print, 
And so my, one of my co-founders I mentioned earlier, Chris Baggett, worked for a company called R.R. Donnelly. And R.R. Donnelly was really the kings of, of, digi, of, of database marketing and, and variable print. And what that means is a cataloger, Land's End, would, would gather a great deal of information about their customers, put it in a database, and then they would leverage that information to send the appropriate content within the catalog. So Tim, you living in Colorado and I was living in Minnesota and based on uh, our geography and based on uh, different purchase uh, patterns in the past, we would get a different catalog. And that was the era that he wrote this thing. But what blows my mind is when I looked at the definition uh, of strategic database marketing written in 1994, uh, it could have been written yesterday. It says the, the purpose of database marketing is to create and maintain a bond of loyalty between you and your customers that'll last a lifetime. Uh, again, Richard, you should steal that for our new tagline uh, at Cheetah Digital. Yeah, that's actually a pretty good tagline. I hope it hasn't been trademarked. But it's, I mean, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a, a fascinating for, in, in many ways um, for me as well to, to sort of hear you talk about this because um. You know, as I've gone through the journey, um, you know, co-founding um, uh, Wayne that became Cheetah Experiences, you know, for, for it, uh, it seemed like, and we founded it, what, 10 years ago now, but for up until maybe, you know, th three years ago, say, the first seven years, it did seem like we were fighting against the stream to some extent of what then was current um, received wisdom in marketing. Yeah. And, you know, we were going out trying to talk to marketers and say, look, we've created this platform that uh, has all these amazing, engaging ways of interacting with consumers and collecting data where they explicitly tell you about them themselves, their motivations, their desires, their interests, and you collect their opt-ins and then you, you market to them. Um, and it seemed like that was the sensible thing to do from, from what I was, you know, where we were coming from as, as founders. But we did meet a lot of resistance in those first seven years because we were talking to people say, well, why, why do I need to know who my customers are? You know, I can do very hyper-personalized uh, uh, marketing through Facebook and Google, uh, mm. and I don't really need to know who my customers are. And I, I remember coming out of meetings and talking to very, very senior people, you know, Fortune 100 companies, thinking that either they're mad or I'm mad, or right. the rules of gravity have somehow uh, turned upside down. Yet, you know, when you're, you're talking about you know, these inspirational books that were written in 1994, you know, they are the rules of gravity in marketing, in, in my view. And it seems like we're now returning to that with this big push to first party data again. Could, couldn't agree more, which actually, you know, kind of brings us to the, to the, the second book, right? Mary said there was two books that really drove uh, the, the formation of, of Exact Target. And uh, the, so the second is, is this, and I love the cover of this book, right? This is the Bible. Uh, it's Permission Marketing by Seth Godin. Uh, this book was, it's a little more recent. This book was published in 99. So, you know, when we started the business, it started uh, Exact Target in 2000. It just, it basically, it just come out. And uh, this really gets to what you were describing, uh, uh, Richard, is that what Seth talks about in this book is the difference between what he calls interruption marketing. So at the time, uh, Facebook didn't exist and Google didn't exist. The walled gardens didn't exist. But what Seth was describing is the contrast between uh, interruption marketing, which he talked about as kind of traditional advertising, right? You're watching a, a TV program and you're interrupted, kind of rudely interrupted, and the marketer's trying to get your attention, desperately trying to get your attention, versus what he, what, what Seth has defined and, and actually built, you know, the whole, his, his whole universe around is this idea of permission marketing. The idea of how do you build over time, gain the permission, gain the trust of customers and, and build a relationship over time. And Seth, I'll never do it justice, but Seth has the foundation of the book is, is this idea of interruption marketing uh, uh, it is one way of getting married and permission marketing is a different way of getting married. And he describes an inter interruption marketer as a guy who goes out and buys a brand new suit, beautiful, shiny pair of shoes. Uh, goes to the first singles bar uh, he finds and and simply taps everyone he sees on the shoulder and asks, "Would you like to get married?" 
uh, versus permission marketing is probably something more 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 uh, accustomed to as it relates to you know how all of us found our life partners um, and so this book is 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 uh, it, it's really amazing what it what what, he would, what Seth was able to see and how that's evolved over time. Yeah, it's, I mean that's a a, a really interesting um, you know point this this difference between permission marketing and interruption marketing because you know whilst I was thinking that the rules of gravity had been somehow upended with um, this era of very fast and loose data and hyper personalized content through Facebook and, and Google I think it's fair to say that most of us in our working professional lives will take the easy route if there is an easy route. And right. I think we did through the, an era of extremely fast and loose data controls, you know, Facebook with its coterie of third party data uh, suppliers and its integrations and all the rest of it did make it very, very easy for you to not really know who your customers are and to, to deliver great hyper-personalized marketing. I think what's very interesting that's making it go back to the future is we now have this unstoppable wave around privacy, um, you know, really spotlighting how why marketers shouldn't snoop on consumers and you know why third party data is uh, a bad thing. And no, it's not just um, privacy legislation; it's also consumer attitudes. We we don't you know we we understand privacy post Cambridge Analytica in a way that we didn't when we was first starting uh, way in uh, uh, as a, as a company. And I think that that's an interesting play here. Yeah, I agree. And I think that's what makes, uh, you know, that's why I picked permission marketing as, as you know, because it is more relevant today than when he wrote it. And again, Seth, 20 years ago, is just making the business case, if you will, of permission marketing versus interruption marketing. He didn't foresee the fact that, I don't know, a better way to say this, as marketers, and I'll include myself as a marketer, we got lazy. Um, we, we could, uh, by taking a big part of our marketing budget and handing it to the walled gardens, as you mentioned, they could create hyper personalized, very targeted, uh, you know, in the right time frame messages to our customers as a B2C brand. It's just that we didn't. It was it was a black box. It is a black box. We we don't have the data. We don't have access to the data, and they were doing that work for us. And so what's happened is as that is unwound, and uh, consumers have gotten wise, and and legis appropriate legislation has occurred. Um, we've had to go back to the basics, which is uh, of both of these books, which is building a house list. So something we didn't talk about in the in the Hughes book is he spends all of this time talking about a house list. Right. And and uh, a big chunk of the book is about how do you how do you build a house list? And a house list, by the way, for those of you who haven't been doing this for as long as I have, a house list is just a list of your customers and their preferences. And what they purchased before, why they've purchased it, um, everything you can learn about those customers. And Hughes goes on to to develop this whole idea of of LTV. Like how how do you how do you how do you determine what the value of that list is? And it's really about the long term value of that relationship with the customer. And so again, uh, even though these books are older than I am, or older than at least my career in digital marketing is. Uh, they're more relevant today than when I think when they were written. And I, uh, you know, I think this is, a, uh, I've 100% seen this in, in, you know, my own experiences over the last 10 years. And it, it used to sort of almost um, befuddle me. Um, you know, I'd, I'd go be going into customers and I'm, you know, approaching them, uh, trying to uh, talk to them about how they should use interactive experiences to, you know, massively increase their, their house list, their, you know, their, their, their marketing database. And you know, you you sometimes get caught up in conversations where people were really f getting very worried about the detail of their messaging strategy and their messaging platforms and whether they had this widget or that widget. And it used to frustrate me because I used to sit there going, "I could triple your whole database in a year, right?" And every single KPI you're talking about is tripled. And I I still think to this day that a lot of companies haven't yet figured out how to actually grow their their database. And they're just leaving dollars on the table, right? They, it's it's. I hate to even admit this because this will really date date my, uh, my my time in this industry. But back when Exact Target first launched, we we were again. I mentioned we were working with a lot of mom and pop uh, uh, retailers, 
uh, and service providers, uh, dry cleaners is an example. And we would literally, one of the techniques that we would, we would help these folks with is to put a fishbowl at their checkout area to gather the business cards to get, you know, to, to get, and, and, and with that, again, a value exchange associated with it, right? So what, what would that customer, that prospective customer get out of providing their information, their permission? Um, and so I, I hate to say it, Richard, but the, you know, 10 years before the beginning of Engage Sciences and Weigh In, you know, we, we were trying to help uh, a small and mid-sized businesses build a house list uh, in, in a, uh, in an analog world, um, which is really, if you think about what, Cheetah experiences is it's it's applying that to uh, at scale to a digital to a digital universe. Yeah, you mentioned scale. Um, uh, you probably don't know this, but we just finished our most successful month ever in terms of the volume of people that have come through in a single month and actually uh, converted on a campaign and provided their answers, filled in their data, and put in their opt-ins, and it was half a billion in a month. A half a billion in one month? Half a billion in one month. So, uh, you know. Yeah, I, I think maybe in some of those fish bowls, we were able to capture uh, five or 600 cards in a year. So that's, uh, yeah, I guess the scale is slightly different. So this, the scale is, 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 is incredible now. And I, and I think what we're seeing, which is very, very interesting, is we're seeing a shift because of all the disruption that's caused by uh, privacy and consumer attitudes on snooping on them and the, you know, Google coming out with the death of the cookie, et cetera, et cetera. Everybody knows the answer is first party data. They understand they need to build out uh, their first party database. They need to also uh, understand uh, you know, and pull all the data around it, individual consumers across all their channels, POS systems, databases, CRM systems, et cetera. So they need to make use of that first party data to drive personalized messaging. But what we're seeing is people coming to us going, right, stage one, Let's build the database. How do I turn the unknown consumer into a known consumer? And obviously, that's where we we help. It's great to see the numbers. Yeah, yeah. I think the, you know, uh, uh, touching on that, I think the other thing that's 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 really uh, pretty amazing after re looking at both of these books is the, the other the other thing that's changed significantly. It's not just the shift from uh, it, it uh, uh, well. A revisiting of a house list. Uh, but the other thing that's kind of a dream come true today that wasn't there 20 years ago, or even 10 years ago when you started weigh in, is uh, what databases are capable of, right? There's been, right. even in the time from when, uh, when Salesforce acquired Exact Target to when uh, we, we created Cheetah Digital, you know, and spun that out of Experian, it was about a three, four year period of time. And in that three or four year period of time, uh, Hadoop happened, right? So I think of the, I think of the F Forrest Gump and the T-shirt the scene. But I mean, big data or Hadoop and public clouds uh, and all of the corresponding Hadoop technology, I think I'm thinking, I'm thinking of Hive. But basically what happened is in the, in the era, uh, the initial era of, of exact target and the like, the companies of that era, they were really list building tools, right? And and the the databases were were based on a batch process. So massive files that got updated on a scheduled basis. And you could do amazing segmentation and run pretty solid analysis on that. Um, but then a Hadoop happened and all of a sudden big data becomes available and the database becomes not just this place where massive files are updated on a, on a nightly or an hourly basis, but now marketers can have access to lots of different types of data uh, at different velocities. Um, and it's amazing what you, one can accomplish in terms of targeted personalized messaging because you, you have streaming data, uh, you, you've got real-time data, and on top of that, now there's a whole class of technologies around AI and machine learning. So the marketer can uh, not only has a lot more data coming at a much faster pace to have a better view of what a customer wants or what they may want next, but they actually have some bionics to help them that just weren't available when I started my company or you started your, your first company. So this must be central to the strategy that you've had for Cheetah Digital. If you can just uh, uh, just comment on that, I think it'd be great for for our, for our listeners. 
Yeah, it's it. it um, there's really there was really two things that drove uh, drove me to get back in the in, in this business and to uh, to see the the real opportunity to have a independent company that was focused, completely dedicated to marketers. And in this case, B2C enterprise marketers is really, I think, what we do best. Um, the, the first I've already mentioned, the first driver was uh, somebody needed to leverage all, all this new database technology, the ability to take batch data at scale, which the industry had been based on, and then combine that with real-time and streaming data uh, to create a new data platform uh, that all of these, all of this, uh, all the insights and action could be driven off of. And I felt like we were in the best place to do that. And that's exactly what we've done over the last couple of years. That was the first driver of why on earth I would get back into this industry. I felt like that new technology was just unfinished business. Uh, and the second, uh, I think, you know, you guys, the two of you are great examples of that. I, I wanted, I, we wanted to create a, a place where we could be a magnet for the best talent in the industry, that we could find uh, the place where people who have, you know, Richard, you know, you, you started a company and you pulled a bunch of people together that are that are expert and passionate about zero and first party data and and building a tool that could collect five. Did you say ha- five hundred million last yeah, month? Half a million. Um, yeah, and so I think what we we what we stri- we've been striving to do, and I think we're 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 well on our way is is to is to rethink what uh, database marketing and digital marketing can look like with this state-of-the-art data platform. And then the other part is to continue to be a magnet for the best talent in the industry. People who are really focused on marketers and helping them achieve their goals. Now, that, and that's you know, uh, uh, great to hear. The, 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 I think folks that have been listening to this podcast for a while will, will know uh, and know some terms that we have a maniacal focus on helping uh, marketers actually establish direct connections to consumers to turn the unknown to known and then provide the value exchange to that consumer to learn more about them, to better personalize your marketing, to orchestrate the customer journey, and to hopefully tie them in long-term into loyalty programs uh, to uh, increase customer lifetime value. I mean, that's it's, that's essentially our, our strategy. And I think the, the one thing that is really interesting for me, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put Tim on the spot here in, in a moment, is... The fact that you're building these applications of how you interact and connect with the consumer, you know, onto this data platform. So the application layer for managing loyalty, managing messages, managing experiences is deeply intertwined with the data layer, means that the data that is being collected is actually actionable. And I know Tim through you know, being a, a, the, the managing director of uh, Audience Sherpa as an agency working with a whole bunch of accounts, um, one of the biggest frustrations uh, that folks have is actually making the data actionable. Tim, uh, what, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, making it actionable is everything. If you don't have a plan in a place and a way to connect with the consumers on the data that you're, you're collecting, it's, it's, it's meaningless. And we had a great podcast that we shot earlier today that'll be out where we talked to someone who was ahead, uh, Scott Cunningham, who was the head of the Media News Group Interactive where as a publisher, they really wanted to know certain things so that they could act upon it. So, you know, clients we're using uh, that we're working with that are using the Cheetah products, they can actually fire the right email message if we can get the right psychographic data. We're loading, even at Cheetah, if we know enough about, you know, opted in data, we can get the right message and load those back to the wall gardens, the duopolies, other publishers that we're working with to reach our audiences. So, you know, being able to act on that data in real time. Uh, in fact, I have a stat for you guys at Audience Sherpa. We found across all of our clients, which are everything from beverage to esports to entertainment to outdoor, et cetera. If you can actually get somebody to take an experience, a sweepstakes, a poll, a survey, a, a product follow up, whatever it might be, and you can get Within three minutes, I think it was three minutes, if you can get an email message or an SMS back to them within three minutes, you're going to get a 75% open rate. We actually had one client that sent 30,000 over the course of a, of a small campaign, 30,000 automated emails. They had a 78% open rate and a 93% click rate to the call to action. So imagine this, advertising, disruptive, right? Hey, guys, check this out. We'd love to get your feedback on this and that. We'll get you the right offer. Got people through the funnel, in through Cheetah, using all cheese. 
70, I think it was 78% open rate and a 90, you know, 90 plus percent click rate. And they drove tens of thousands of dollars in a moment. And that's not unique. I mean, a lot of brands struggle with that, but that's the technology we're talking about, right? These databases, especially if your actions can be native inside the platform where your data is hosted, the right message, the right place, the right loyalty offer. It's, it's unbelievable what can happen. So we're, we're talking really here about marketing to individuals, you know, with a framework which collects data in a transparent way to understand motivations, desires, and interests, and then applying, you know, data from other areas that you might have, POS systems, CRM, et cetera, with machine learning to better personalize marketing to an individual. But I, and, I, and I think that's great. We're doing a fantastic job there. But the bit that, that uh, maybe I could get you to comment on, Peter, that I find personally interesting, which is this idea that in a world where uh, uh, ad tech is being severely disrupted because of privacy, um, you know, as a brand, you need to think it's not just about creating great content anymore and, you know, and abrogating responsibility of who your customers are to Facebook and Google. You've actually got to establish that direct connection. You've got to build up your first party database. Um, you've got to isolate yourself from some of this uh, disruption. And that requires a value exchange, you know, to get data from people to actually have that consumer giving you that their, their time to engage and, and interact. And I think this is where um, you guys have been very, very smart, you know, before you made the acquisition of, of Wayne and having cheating experiences in really making loyalty such a big component of your strategy because it provides this framework to engage with consumers on a, on a value exchange. Where did, where, did, where did that come from? Why, wh wh how, did, how did you think about you know, loyalty and, and, and deeply tying that into the strategy of the company? Yeah, I, I, where all good ideas come from, which is talking to customers uh, and prospects, right? Uh, and it's funny, we, we, when we inherited this business, when we uh, spun out what became Cheetah Digital from Experian, we, we went on a, a tour and talked to customers that had been with Cheetah in many cases for more than a decade. It was amazing to, to be involved in a business where you had long-term customers and just go and talk to them. So it's amazing what will happen, right? The world can look pretty complex. It really isn't in that case if you just ask a lot of questions. And what we found is what most of our B2C marketers were, uh, were struggling with, what they wanted to create was a long-term connection with their customers based on a value exchange, that, that they're adding value in every time they interact with those customers. And in turn, those customers were spending more time, more mind share, maybe more wallet share with, with that brand. And so it became clear to us that this loyalty category uh, was not well productized, right? So what happened from, when you look at email uh, and all those great companies that were started in 99 and 2000 and 2001, is many of the use cases uh, that matter in email and then in mobile and social messaging have been have become part of a product. There's a product feature. There's a button in the app that can help a marketer run a program at scale. Loyalty is is very different. It's less mature than that, um, but it was so. So it became very clear that the goal of those B two C marketers as the walled gardens and all the and, and it, you know that they could that marketers couldn't count on those walled gardens and just move their budget over there they needed to build a relate the build a list build a relationship and that the ultimate metric was loyalty and then we looked around and we thought boy there's this is not well productized there there's not uh there's not the foundation of a of a great solution out there um so we searched the world over and it ended up finding a really fantastic a company in Stellar Loyalty that uh, was was founded by uh, ex Oracle and Siebel folks that and that had run the loyalty business uh, at Siebel, which was really an amazing product back in the day, well, well ahead of it uh, of the curve. And they'd taken those concepts, those ideas of of loyalty at scale, and then of course Hadoop happened, and they built their application uh, based on on Hadoop, and it was a bit of marriage, marriage made in heaven. So we had these customers saying, what I really want to do is I, I want to be able to uh, apply technology. I want to be able to apply software solutions to create loyalty programs that work. Um, and then we, we happened to find a 
a partner who eventually became part of Cheetah Digital uh, to help us to help us build that out uh, pretty quickly. Yeah, that's fantastic. Now I've got uh, my last question for you, <laughs> um, which follows on from um, a previous podcast uh, that we did with my former chairman at Weigh In, uh, Scott McNeely. Um, Scott, as uh, anyone knows, has watched him on TV, whatever, is a, a small government guy. And <laughs> although he hundred uh, percent is, you know, maniacally like the rest of us, focused on the fact that brands should embrace zero party data and there should be a value exchange in return uh, for the data that you ask from consumers in order to better personalize your marketing and all the rest of it. Um, he doesn't believe that government has a role in, uh, to do legislation for that. And actually, you know, the consumers will naturally move to uh, uh, brands that don't snoop on them and it's just good practice. I wanted to throw uh, that out to you, somebody that probably from the other side of the political spectrum, is there a role for, the, <laughs> is there a role for legislation? Well, let me just start by saying it was uh, uh, getting to know you and then having an opportunity to meet Scott McNeely as a business person uh, that works in the world of software and technology. Uh, it's a great thrill. Uh, and uh, Scott's done very well in, 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 in life. He may have won that contest, but you'll be shocked to know this, Richard, that, and I'm sure, I'm sure Scott knows this as well. We, we feel differently. He and I feel maybe a little bit differently about politics. Um, and I actually had, we, we had uh, the, uh, the industry that I, we started in, which was primarily email, had a really good experience with, with legislation and a legislative process. So in the early days of email uh, and the early days of, you know, Seth, I, I not all folks in the email world or email marketing world were, were following permission practices. Uh, and there was some really, there's some bad actors out there and it was starting to harm um, the entire growth of, a, of, a, of database marketing and, and email marketing. And then there was the, uh, uh, the, there was some legislation in the U.S., the Can Spam Act, that then actually got replicated in other markets. And the Can Spam Act actually became a, a driver uh, for our industry and, a, and, a, and, a, and, and became a kind of a common set of rules that uh, brands would use and, co and consumers could have expectations about receiving an email. And in fact, it was the Can Spam Act that uh, legislated the unsubscribe button at the bottom of, bottom of an email. And you know, I'd, I'd like the good providers were already doing that, but it forced everybody to do that, or frankly, that communication was illegal. And I think what happened is the entire industry kind of uh, it, it ended up growing much faster after the Can Spam Act because consumers got more comfortable with the fact that if they signed up for an email and they know that and it no longer added value, which put a lot of pressure on marketers. By the way, you always have to be adding value. Um, but if it no longer added a value, they could they could opt out and they could they could remove themselves from that communication. Um, so uh, I never want to disagree with a billionaire, uh, but just didn't, just think it's a bad policy. Uh, sorry, Scott. But in this case, I, I do think that legislation uh, can be a positive, and I think the the legislation out of Europe that's and then the the re more recent legislation in California beginning to create just ground rules and a definition of of privacy and giving consumers recourse if they feel like their data has been used uh, inappropriately, I think, is, I think is a good thing for the industry, and it's certainly a good thing for consumers. This is a great spot. I just wanted to mention, we just commissioned a, a global study uh, that we are releasing in very early April that goes through how consumers feel about privacy, uh, where they feel that their privacy and, and their data is being stored properly and improperly, what they're willing to give up from a value exchange, what they want in a loyalty program, et cetera. And I'll share one stat, but it's gonna be the culmination of stats when we release this report, be really interesting for brand marketing, is an email today across the globe, especially in the US, in the US, an email is 180% more effective than a banner ad on paid. And it's actually, I believe, 154% more effective than any social media post, paid or organic. Now that's a consumer telling you they would rather get an email over those things. So when you talk about legislation, which is happening right now, the privacy conundrums, et cetera, email, kudos to you. 20 years ago, exact target. I was a client. I used it at AEG and Mark Cuban companies. I loved it. Um, 
But kudos, because email is still incredibly effective. And that's consumers telling us through this global study, thousands of respondents. And I believe, personally, the legislation that's going to come down is going to do exactly what you just said, Peter. It's going to get people back to a comfort level of like, okay, at least somebody's protecting me here. Even if it's the government, whether you trust them or not, if somebody's saying, hey, I can opt out and my data can be you know, expunged or, or recalled, then I think we're going to see this channel grow and flourish. So it's already one of the most effective channels a brand marketer can use. And I think it's even going to get stronger when the legislation comes down. So I'm glad yeah. that, that and, and feel the same way with the camp span and what that did. Yeah. I think just rules of the road that everybody can agree to that are, that at least are a foundation for uh, how brands and consumers interact with one another is, is, is a positive thing again. But, but the theme of this is I got to wear a baseball hat and I just disagreed with a billionaire. We should do this again next week. You know, I don't think he was wearing a hat. So maybe, no. that, maybe that's why. Hey, listen, I, I don't get it. I, I, I McNeely didn't wear a hat. It's not cool. Oh, I, boy. I think I can get him to wear a hat next time. So, uh, yeah. All right. Good luck with that. <laughs> good luck with that. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, Peter, thank you very much for uh, joining Thinking Cats. We hope to, to have you back again. Uh, and, uh, Love, love the fact that you've thrown yourself in it and wearing a, a very uh, fetching cap. Let's continue the uh, the digital marketing book club. Ha happy happy to join you guys anytime. <laughs> Great, agreed. We'll, we'll have some suggestions for you. Thanks for coming. That's it, guys. Thank you, Cass. We'll have Peter back another time. Thanks for watching.